He has uh, is a background for you. He has an incredible job. He is a professional trader. He looks at all the architects, his own decks, speaks to them, buys to their projects. Uh, for the collection. 
And uh, so this would be, this is now applied in uh, not just art, but also jewelry design, cooking, uh, almost uh, any, any field. And um, in Latin, curate means uh, to take care, uh, to take care of uh, a collection, or to curate an exhibition uh, as a curator. And um, this is an interesting picture. This is inside of the world we all know uh, how uh, the most popular places around the world look like today. Uh, Uber is now, the Uber is now visited by, uh, I think, about 9 million people every year. Uh, there are a number of uh, museums around the world which are visited by 5 million people, 6 million people, 3 million people. So the places like museums get really, really crowded. Uh, and everyone is looking for all these items like Mona Lisa. And you see what happens when, uh, you know, in places where these items are, these items are put on display. Uh, everyone is uh, trying to come close, take, take a picture. Uh, but this, what, what really this picture represents and what it tells you is that there is an incredible hunger for new experiences. And how do you, as a curator, how do you capitalize uh, that particular situation? What do you do about it? How do you present new ideas? How do you uh, provide new experiences within or within the museum? or even outside of the museum. And then you can ask all this kind of questions. What is a museum? What is an exhibition? And that is a very good you have to ask What is that? Uh, what do you put on this place? What is worth the uh, So all these questions are new questions. And there is no, what is incredible about this is that there is no one answer. And every time you find an answer, it will become outdated in that case, and you will have to find a new answer and trouble you. And uh, how do you become a curator? And again, this is uh, interesting because uh, we don't really have one particular way uh, of becoming a curator. You don't just go to school. Yeah, sure, sure. Very recently, we started having curatorial programs in universities, but just before that, uh, you will find many curators who don't have curatorial degrees. I'm a curator, I don't have a curatorial degree. So how do you become a curator? And uh, so that's why I think it's it's interesting, particularly now, to uh, look into this uh, field uh, and see you know, different potentials and how how it works. And um, um, there is a quote by an American poet, Dorothy Parker, who said, uh, the cure for boredom is curiosity. And uh, there is no cure for curiosity. And curiosity is really the only prerequisite for being a curator. So first you have to find the subject interesting enough to yourself. And then if it's interesting to you, be able to find ways to excite others and uh, present a particular project or present a particular idea uh, to excite others. And, and then again, uh, it doesn't have to be a traditional uh, exhibition. It's interesting that uh, an exhibition could really be almost anything you imagine. And what is also fantastic is that you can transform an inside space. And by the way, the exhibition could be an exterior project. But in, a, in, in the inside space, you can transform uh, the interior world so much more successfully and uh, so much uh, more effectively than, for example, with architecture. But a building, building usually has the beginning and the end and grasp it as mostly as an object. Uh, but when you go inside of a room, 
you can really totally transform that, that room. And uh, often, uh, you can do it very minimally without the effect uh, a big budget. And here you have uh, three figures who, uh, in, my, in my case, I would say they are kind of my heroes. Uh, so I look uh, after them, uh, you know, I look to them uh, for inspiration. Uh, so the first one, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even say that this person was a curator, right? He made, uh, this is Sergei Degger. Uh, Russian impresario, and uh, he became famous for creating uh, uh, ballet moves. Uh, he was uh, very successful at uh, introducing people to each other and uh, finding the most talented people in various arts to work together on various projects, uh, such as ballets, theaters. And sometimes he did exhibitions as well. Uh, so he died in 1920, so he lived uh, over 100 years ago. Um, but wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that he was a curator in a traditional sense. But again, what's tradition in curating? Because it's uh, such a new field. And uh, uh, you might be very well familiar with the second figure. This is uh, Hans Ulrich Oberst. Uh, he's Swiss. Uh, he also has an interesting path to become a curator. As a very young person, as a teenager, he was very much, even as a child, he was very much interested in museums, museum culture, exhibitions. And, uh, he was born in one of the smallest countries in Europe, in Switzerland. So by the time he was 17 years old, he ran out of all the museums in the country, so he did go to every single museum in Switzerland. And uh, he started traveling outside of Switzerland to, to go to other museums. Uh, he became very, very fascinated with exhibitions and also the people behind cultural projects and started interviewing uh, all these people, uh, mainly artists. And, uh, he has a whole collection of interviews, over 2,000 interviews that he took over the years. Uh, but also interesting that he started doing exhibitions without having any kind of uh, conditions for it, any kind of infrastructure, any kind of financial backing. And how do you how do you start doing that? And again, all you need is a good idea, and you really have to uh, push for it. You don't even have to have space. Uh, if you have a great idea, then you, you, can, you can find uh, ways of doing it. For example, in his case, uh, he did one of his first exhibitions in his own house, in his own kitchen. So he invited eight different artists, local artists, uh, to present their work and to invite their friends. And that became a very popular project. When he was uh, on his, one of his trips in Paris, he invited local uh, artists to present their works in his catalog. And uh, that exhibition became so popular that by the end of uh, his stay in Paris, there were over 250 visitors every single day to his catalog to visit this exhibition. So this just tells you that there are absolutely no limits at what uh, an exhibition could be and how it could be done. The third person is uh, Yulia Bakumov. He is a Russian curator, trained as an architect. And he uh, was very, he became well known as uh, one of the leading uh, architects of so-called paper architecture, uh, which started in the late 80s uh, and was very popular in 90s. It was mainly, uh, mainly uh, students of uh, Moscow Architectural Institute who participated in uh, mainly uh, Japanese conceptual uh, competitions and they started winning these competitions one after another and in just a few years they amassed over 50 different prizes including first prizes. Uh, 
This movement probably would be completely forgotten if it wasn't for this particular uh, curator. He started writing about it, he started doing exhibitions, and now uh, paper architecture became, um, you know, became history. And um, this is just a photo from recent Jeff Bond's exhibition at the Whitney Museum in New York. And um, there is an interesting question. Uh, does the work of art need to be curated? Uh, because it's interesting that when you create a work of art, it's not enough. It's not really a work of art until you put it on display and you have the uh, person. But how? So this is a legitimate question, and uh, there is a Russian-German philosopher, Boris Groys, who says, in its origin, it seems the work of art is sick, helpless. In order to see, viewers must be brought to it as visitors are brought to a bad presentation by hospital staff. It is, a, in fact, no coincidence that by work curator, uh, the, the word curator is etymologically related to cure. Curating is curing. The process of curating cures uh, the image's powerlessness, its uh, incapacity to present itself. The artwork needs external help. Uh, the medicine that makes the image appear healthy, that makes the image literally appear and do so in the best light, is the exhibition. So it's a very interesting kind of metaphor for what an exhibition could be. And uh, when talking about curating architecture, one of the most uh, fundamental questions has to be, what is architecture? And I, I think it's important to ask uh, this question while we are looking at the most extreme, the most uh, experimental, the most unusual, the most radical examples of architecture. And uh, in, in my experience, uh, I've been to this building several years ago, and in my experience, I would say this is probably the most striking architectural experience, or one of the most striking uh, that I ever had. And um, one of the reasons, uh, uh, so there is a quote by Zaka, it says, uh, people say that the most appropriate building is a rectangle because that's typically the best way of using space. But is that to say that landscape is a waste of space? The world is not a rectangle. And then she has very similar ideas, similar quotes that you can find. Uh, but what's interesting to me about this building is that when you encounter it uh, from many uh, uh, points, from many uh, uh, angles, you don't perceive it as a building at all. It completely uh, changes your perspective of what a building is. And what's interesting is that uh, a couple of years ago we had the Pinale, Venice Pinale, uh, by Van Kulhaus, which was un fundamental elements in architecture. So if you look at this building, you don't, uh, from many points, you don't see any fundamental elements. So it's interesting. Uh, you don't have um, you don't see facades, you don't see the roof, you don't distinguish between the ground coming, the facades, the roof. It becomes one continuous uh, kind of landscape. Uh, you don't have windows, you don't have steps in many ways, in many places. You don't have handrails. So it completely changes your perspective, your um, understanding of what architecture is. And then uh, you, you basically ask the question, uh, what, what is it that architecture could be? Instead of uh, saying what architecture is, you always ask the question, what could it be? And um, sorry. Um, another example is uh, Peter Anton. So he says that architect architecture pro problematizes and thus creates functions. It does not answer questions. It asks questions. It does not solve problems. It creates problems. So Peter Eisenman is definitely one of the architects who, uh, uh, who is uh, really uh, uh, focusing on architecture itself. His architecture is basically about itself. Uh, 
so in this particular case, it's very uh, an, an exemplary project that shows how he works. So in this particular case, you have an imposition uh, of four different traces. So in many of his projects, he finds these traces and then superimposes them to create an imaginary site. So this site exists in his mind, uh, but it becomes the real site and it becomes the real uh, world. So this is the project that is the other, which was not, which is still, which still remains to be unfinished, uh, but it may remain unfinished forever because the current, current government uh, refuses to complete the building because the building, the project ran out of money. It was originally supposed to have six buildings and only four were finished. Um, this is um, um, so I didn't mention the layers, but we don't have to go into the details. Uh, but uh, one of the layers is uh, the, the plan, the historical plan of downtown Santiago, and there is a topographical plan of the hill where the building is, is built. And then there is a Cartesian, Cartesian grid, a orthogonal abstract grid, and the final uh, trace is the this uh, shell, which is the symbol of, of Santiago Art City. So through this superimposition, he created this imaginary uh, <clears throat> layering system, which then became, uh, oops, sorry, I'm pressing something wrong. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, what was built in Santiago. So you can see this became the top of the hill and uh, the building represents this superimposition. Uh, there is no beginning, there is no end of this building. It really becomes part of an overall uh, hill, which is similar to the size of the entire downtown Santiago, which is right next door. Um, so Karen mentioned uh, the book, uh, Peter Eisman. So that book uh, just came out going to be available very soon, and it's called uh, Conversations with Peter Eisenman, um, The Evolution of Architectural Style. So, these conversations were taking place in 2003, 2009, 2016, so these are three different conversations, about 70 years apart. Um, so, we're going to continue just a few more radical examples of architecture. This is the work of Tom Main. Uh, he says, architecture is all about taking position, social, environmental, urbanistic, and ecologically. Any architecture is, is there to make a statement. Architecture is, invest in a, is an investigation of multiplicity of forces. We produce spaces that accommodate and enhance human, human activities. Um, in his work, He's not really going after a particular form. He's not really a form-making architect. Uh, but he discovered one particular aspect of his architecture, which is uh, architecture, which is the skin of the building. And in his work, uh, it became very kind of intelligent element, which he is uh, focusing on in many of his projects. And um, I recently had an interesting conversation with Tom May. We talked about um, uh, basically the current moment in architecture. And he said in the interview, uh, he said, you know, when I travel around the world, especially to places like Dubai and Shenzhen, I look at all these towers and I don't understand why we need so many different shapes, why we need so many different buildings. And then he said that he was in Shenzhen on one of the trips, and he spent the entire morning just taking pictures of all these different buildings. And he came back and he looked at the pictures, and he just doesn't understand why we, we need so many different architectures. And I just looked at him and I said, you really don't understand why. He said, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, I'm not looking for different architecture. 
you know, look at this. It isn't it different. Uh, I asked him what kind of project are you working on right now. He said, I'm working on a house. Uh, this is one of my most interesting projects, a house for myself, for my family. And this project is not about form. A form is just a form. But it is about my position. Uh, it is about my world. It is about what I feel about my family at this time, at my age, right now. So I asked him, and do you think this house, it will represent your internal world? Or will it uh, somehow respond to, to the context around the house? And he said, of course it's going to represent my internal world. It's based on my ideas, and my uh, view of architecture, or my view of myself. And I said, well, you answered the wrong question, because uh, the reason we have so many different architectures, so many different forms and shapes, not because we need them, but because they are done by architects like yourself. Uh, and everyone wants to reflect their own internal world. And they don't look at the total picture. It's only when you become a critic, you realize, wait a minute, why do we need so many different types of architecture? But the architects themselves, they don't ask this question because they, they are busy doing something else. They are busy doing individual works. And um, usually when you work on architectural exhibitions, you uh, produce images, you produce uh, photographs of buildings. And uh, inevitably you have to ask such a question such a question as, for example, what is an image? Or if you present uh, paintings, you ask yourself, what is a painting? So you have to start from the very most basic questions. And uh, you shouldn't ever take anything for granted. Because the most basic question you can always uh, you know, rethink. And um, this is a particular project by Don Lisinski called Brown Room, designed in 1923. And uh, he said uh, about this project, he said, the image is not a painting, but a structure around which we must circle, looking at, looking at it from all sides, peering down from above, investigating from below. Uh, so this is a kind of environment that you almost can walk into it. Well, you can literally walk into it and imagine yourself kind of floating over it or within it. And yet, this is called painting. So it, told, it just tells you that if this environment, this installation can be called a painting, imagine what can be an exhibition. So there is absolutely no limit at what an exhibition would be. And this uh, some of the examples uh, of what Elvis Sisky did as an exhibition designer. And he was many different things uh, in his career, uh, but he considered himself primarily as an exhibition designer. So he used all kinds of materials and ways of exhibiting uh, imagery. And, um, Uh, so he used uh, new exhibition techniques, materials uh, such as glass, mirrors, uh, celluloid, uh, nickel, uh, and um, he also used films, continuously running films all the time. And uh, for example, on the exhibition from 1928 on the left side in Cologne, it became so popular, so dynamic that uh, when it was shown, the crowds were so big that they had to close down the exhibition a number of times just to make sure that everyone was safe because it was so um, uh, exciting to people because they almost the exhibition itself became like a stage, not just to show the material on display, but also the people were on the stage. So it became a very dynamic, very active place. And uh, these are some other uh, exhibitions, 
So it's like it's designed by an elegant uh, this particular exhibition by an elegant labyrinth of uh, white wooden lattices raised uh, well above the floor and supported by this field of graphics. And when you would be moving around, some, some images would come into focus, some images would recede. And this became a very exciting, very dynamic way of uh, creating exhibitions. And then another uh, project, which is not really an exhibition, it's an art project. Uh, that was done in 97 by Rita McBride with called National Chain. And what it is, is it's just a two by two, uh, two, by two uh, ceiling grid, which was lowered to about uh, you know, neck height. And uh, people who were visiting this space were forced to, uh, you know, to kneel down and uh, pop up immediately after that. So this would restrict the movement of people within the gallery space. And, it would fall, and there was nothing outside this clip. So this grid became the subject matter of this particular exhibition. And uh, it completely transforms your view of, of the space and uh, restricts your movements. Uh, so it's interesting that an exhibition could be, uh, again, could be almost a new and uh, this is a particular uh, work by Friedrich Kissler, done in 1925, City of Space. And uh, this display was uh, created to show uh, various theater objects uh, for Austrian theater. Uh, but this construction, this superstructure, was so exciting, so unusual, so interesting that it became the real focus of, uh, of the attention of the visitors. And it became so popular uh, that many, many times after 1925, this particular structure was recreated and it was shown without any of the displays. It was shown by itself. Because you can really imagine this project as a totally new kind of floating in space city and it doesn't really have a scale. You could imagine it and uh, the, last, the last time it was shown was in uh, 2006, then United at the uh, Austrian Pavilion. Uh, and again, it was recreated uh, by, by itself. And these are some of the examples of the work of uh, also Friedrich Kisler, uh, the same architect who immigrated from Austria and did a number of exhibitions in New York uh, for Petty Moving Time. And others. And he was really the first designer, first architect who uh, tried to erase uh, the boundary between the floor, the walls, and the ceiling to make uh, a total, very dynamic, uh, very uh, flu fluid, uh, kind of uh, fluent uh, space. So, and you can see that he, he used a number of revolutionary techniques which we often take for granted. But for example, uh, you can see these paintings uh, taken outside of their frames. So this was very unusual at the time to take a painting outside of a frame because when you usually uh, put a painting in a frame and put it against the wall, uh, it becomes a world on its, on its own uh, and in itself. And uh, when you look at the painting, usually you completely, your mind is taking you somewhere else. You are no longer within the space. But by taking the frames out, uh, the paintings become objects in the space and become part of the space. And they were floating uh, in space freely as opposed to just hanging. Uh, against the wall. And um, here, another technique, he used this uh, kind of baseball bats to, to fix the, the images. And he separated them from the wall, and they became these floating objects. And again, very original, very uh, unusual way of using furniture as uh, uh, seats and also as display tables. <sighs> Thank you.
And uh, this has uh, a couple of words by Herbert Bayer, who was also a uh, German exhibition designer. And here you can see how he tried to uh, surround the viewer with pictures at different angles and uh, create this kind of immersive environment. And uh, also what he tried to do is to create a particular sequence uh, with the spire, so you would, uh, you know, with, with this design, he would control what picture you would see first. And so it's interesting how the particular design can totally control the behavior of uh, visitors. And um, architectural exhibitions would be uh, uh, also used as uh, experimental laboratories. So in this particular case, this is quite interesting. This was uh, an exhibition uh, made by Shigeru Ban, Japanese architect. Uh, this was his very first exhibition, very soon after he graduated uh, from Cooper in the 19th early 1980s, and one of his professors was Emilia Nambas, a dream architect. And he uh, designed an exhibition of Emilia Nambas uh, using this uh, paper tubes. And he used the paper tubes as supports for different displays. He also used paper tubes to transport the fabric, you know, for storage of the fabric. And he did this exhibition, and when the exhibition was over, he kept uh, the paper tubes uh, without even thinking about how to use them. But a year later, he was asked to design an exhibition on the work of uh, Alvaralto. And Alvaralto is uh, very well known for the use of his wood. And uh, he initially wanted to use pure wood in, in the exhibition, but it was very, very expensive. And at that time, he realized that uh, why, why does he Try to use paper tools. So he went to a local factory and realized that you can uh, produce paper tools of almost any, any size, different lengths, and it's very cheap material. So this is when he started to use this material and uh, kind, of re kind of rediscovered material and introduced it into architecture and became one of his most. Uh, recognizable kind of uh, staples of his design. So you can see in the work of Shigeru uh, Ban that he uses paper now basically in every single project. And uh, so the whole idea is that an exhibition becomes uh, this laboratory through which, through which you uh, discover yourself in architecture, your place in architecture. So uh, an architectural exhibition is not just about celebrating your work, it's not just about going back, but it would be about going forward. And then you ask this question, what is a museum? Uh, so uh, Hope Valerie in 1920s said, I don't like museums, many are admirable, but none are delightful. Uh, but every creative museum should prove him wrong, basically, as a starting point. How do you make a museum a delightful environment? And Brenton Cannon, for example, says a museum is a place where one should lose one's head. So that's the goal for quite a few museum designers. And this is a particular uh, building done by Elena Bobardi, who was originally from Italy, uh, but immigrated to Brazil. <coughs> Uh, recently, we celebrated 100 years anniversary of her life, of her uh, birth. And, uh, she became, uh, she was rediscovered, and many books were published, and many exhibitions were held all around the world. Uh, but this is probably her uh, most famous project, my state in, in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, built in 1968. And she, what she did, she lived in the building. Uh, over the site, and uh, the whole building uh, became kind of floating, and the space under the 
ballet called the museum can be used in many different ways. So it could be used for concerts, it could be used for markets, and, and, and so on. And uh, another question, do museums need walls? And uh, this museum is really experimental. It completely reapproaches of uh, the question of what museum is. So for example, this particular uh, floor uh, didn't have a single wall uh, to show a traditional, traditional collection of paintings. This, uh, this is the main collection of, uh, of the museum. And this, uh, there are many Renaissance portraits and so on. Uh, but she came up with the idea of this particular display where she would show the painting attached to the glass wall and you would be able to walk around the painting and see not only the front but you would also see the back and you could read the whole archaeology of the history of this particular painting because you could see for example the labels from um, different auction houses the history, you could read the history of the painting not only the subject matter but uh, when it was purchased and where it came from and so on so, and uh, if you go to a number of museums now, you can see similar ways of displaying artworks, and you will see that some people spend more time behind the paintings than in front of the paintings, because it may be equally fascinating. Uh, and then there is another question, should museums preserve their past? Uh, do you keep uh, that particular display constantly? You know, you preserve it, or do you keep transforming the museum? And uh, that particular museum was transformed. Uh, that display was completely redone. Uh, all the podiums, uh, you know, all this system of displaying artworks was uh, completely abandoned, and they uh, built regular walls. And until recently, they presented the paintings in a very conventional way. Uh, but recently they decided to go back, so they recreated the original display. And now the question is, uh, did they, was it, was it the right move? Was it uh, the way to go? And what's going to be the next thing? Do you keep this idea or do you transform the city? So this is an interesting way of question. And uh, this is another exhibition by Frank Kohlhaas. Chronic House exit. So this is uh, a small project by Jack Kohlhaas. It's very complex and very controversial. Uh, there are many conflicts and ideas running uh, against each other. And for example, the name of the exhibition, uh, this at the same time, it means chronicle and it means chaos. So it's a chronicle chaos. There's a two conflicting words. He combined them into one. And uh, this particular exhibition was first designed for Venice. It was shown in uh, 2010, Venice Architecture United. It was very beautifully done, with very few elements. He uh, <coughs> suspended this pipes and then uh, presented the imagery on both sides. And uh, every image became almost like a block, almost like a built uh, street. And there were rows of, of streets within the uh, space. So it, it became uh, a very three-dimensional experience by using just two-dimensional, very simple elements. And what he presented in this exhibition was his ideas about preservation. So he picked two uh, main ideas about preservation. One was about uh, modernizing buildings, and the second idea is about preserving them. Uh, so these are two different approaches, two different schools of preservation. And uh, in the imagery, he supported both ideas with statistics, with different examples, and people would walk around and uh, decide for themselves which particular school thought they liked. So this exhibition became very popular 
and about a year later it came to New York. And in 2011 it was shown in uh, New Museum. Uh, what's interesting about that is that, so this is the interior, uh, but it wasn't presented in the New Museum itself, it was presented right next door. So the New Museum granted a uh, space uh, which, just, which used to be a rundown uh, kitchen supply store. And they didn't restore the space, they just left it the way it was and uh, had the exhibition. Uh, but uh, Grand Profound did something very smart. So he walked into the space, drew a line right through the middle of the space, and he restored one half. He transformed it into a kind of white box gallery space. And on the, on the other half, he left as is. And by doing that, he uh, basically expressed his own, uh, you know, he expressed his two ideas about preservation. So one was about transformation, and the second half was about uh, preservation. And the uh, exhibition itself was presented in the entire space. So what's interesting about this is that he made this trick which was very difficult to see. For example, when I walked into this exhibition space, I was my attention was drawn completely to, to the imagery. And I just went through that through this entire exhibition. I read you know, some of the text, I saw all the images, and I just left until I, I read the review of the exhibition in the New York Times. And this is when I first for the first time I I, I realized that this is this is what he did with the space. He renovated half of the space and the other half, and I didn't see it. So it may look very striking on this photograph, but in reality, I think 99% of the people, the visitors, didn't notice it. And he played this trick. He didn't do it in Venice, but he did it. He did it in New York. And um, here's the work of. Uh, Pokemola, uh, old bricks. So again, it's this question, what is architecture? And uh, for him, uh, there is a quote by Pokemola. He says, uh, we wanted to create architecture that changed like clouds. We wanted to create an architecture that bleeds, that breaks, that lights up, that, and tears under stress, alive or dead. It pulled, then pulled us a, a block of ice. It cut, and cut as a blaze when architecture marks blades. And this sounds like a real uh, manifesto, very kind of uh, <coughs> strong manifesto. And it seems like there is no place for this kind of thinking in architecture, which is very stable, which is, uh, uh, it has to, it has to stand, it has to, cannot just change like the place in between. And at the same time, when you ask these questions, when you force this kind of, when you initiate this kind of thinking, uh, it's, uh, there are ways for realizing this ideas. And you can see that just eight years later, he was able to make a small project, which is, uh, conceptually, is the place in between. And uh, it was incredibly difficult to build this because uh, when it was presented for the first time uh, to the mayor of Vienna, he didn't understand it. He said, well, oh, this is not architecture. How can we approve this? And then the architect asked, so what do you think this is? And the mayor said, well, oh, this is some kind of art. And Wolfric said, can I have it on paper? Can you say that this is art? And then it was approved as an art project. So it doesn't matter what you call it. But in the end, it became architecture. And, um, and this is one of his buildings. So now you can see that he's, he has become a very successful architect with building all over the world, buildings that change like clouds. And you can't deny it. They, they do change like clouds, like clouds, even though they're very stable uh, buildings. And yet, uh, the form itself so dynamic, uh, so 
constantly changing, that uh, you could say that what he projected in the very beginning of his career as an investor really was realized. He says, in my studio, the future, the future architects learn, so he, he's talking about his uh, practice. Uh, the future architects learn to develop ideas and to argue them conceptually. They learn to shape their ideas, not conditioned by the reality of constraints and cliches, but by the reality of possibilities. So the reality is not what we know, it's what we uh, try to imagine. And uh, the point of departure is to develop space with the multi multitude of data courses. And it's interesting that uh, many architects today uh, very much you know, against this idea they are trying to turn away from form making, pure form making, into uh, something else. And uh, for example, when I talked about, when I quoted Bob Briggs to Alejandro Arden a couple of years ago, he was really mad about this approach to architecture because he thinks that uh, the world, we, we have so many problems in the world, we can, we can be so busy with some pragmatics that we have no time to Thinking that it's not leading anywhere. It's not But um, I think there is a place for all kinds of architecture in the world. And um, this is another example that architecture could be a kind of laboratory. And, uh, and not just architecture, but an architectural exhibition. So when you, when, when you uh, work on an exhibition, Again, yeah, it's about the questions that you ask. And it's not just celebrating what you already achieved, but you ask yourself, what do, where do you go next? And this was an exhibition by Ruben Mar H, who was here not that long ago. And uh, this is a, an exhibition that was done over 20 years ago. And this was um, based on his idea of uh, using materials that would change with temperature. So you would see in, in the colors of this uh, patterns, for example, you would touch, you can see some of the fingerprints. So you would touch the wall, and if, you, if your hand is, is warm, it would uh, you know, fade away. And then after a little while, it would become more intense. It would go back to its original color. So you could walk into the space and you would trace, you would be able to trace what people touched and where they moved and how. You, know, you could see this kind of uh, choreography of people moving through space. And then we can ask, so who cares? Uh, why does it have to do anything with architecture? And uh, you, you don't really know one, you, you keep asking the questions uh, in hope that you will come up with certain answers, not necessarily the right answers. But this, at that time, it became a kind of work in progress. It became an installation that showed that particular choreography of movement. Uh, he also worked on this guest book where he used similar materials. He used the a heat sensitive ink. So you would come to this book, you would write down your uh, impression of this exhibition. And while you were writing, your ink would disappear. You wouldn't see what you wrote. And then the next person would come over and the ink would come forward. You know, through, and you would be able to read what another person wrote. And again, so, so what? So how is it related to architecture? And it's not really a to architecture, but you keep moving, you keep working on different ideas, different exhibitions. And um, what's interesting is that by doing this, he discovered uh, uh, patterns, he discovered uh, <coughs> privacy, you know, privacy protection uh, patterns. And, sorry, this is, yeah. And I should have changed the order of the slides. But this, uh, the pens on the inside of the 
and laws to protect from doing what's inside. So he started collecting these patterns and uh, using them for his inspiration, for his projects. And you can see um, the slide that I had before. Uh, he worked on different scales. He would scale up certain fragments. He would overlap. He would uh, uh, overlay um, and superimpose different uh, parts of the pattern. And he created his own language of architecture, which uh, very few architects did. And uh, at the same time, you know, it, it is very abstract. But at the same time, it's instantly recognizable as this property, uh, you know, this uh, private uh, privacy protection patterns. You, it's associated with his name. If you if you uh, Google now his patterns, you will see that his name will come up with those because he created this collection of patterns, and he basically, um, uh, you know, owns them the whole idea, and uh, this is where most of his initial ideas come from. Um, so when I ask him where do you, you know, where do you usually start with your architecture, does it, uh, is it more about the context or is it about something else? And he said that most of it is about uh, my own body of work. So his body of work became the main, uh, the main context for his projects. And uh, he works on different scales, scale of architecture and scale of exhibitions, different installations. And for example, here you can see this are uh, different numbers overlooked, and they create this particular pattern. And some of the numbers become three-dimensional objects, but they become and um, just to show you a couple of examples of different exhibitions that I like myself, uh, this was uh, Venice Architecture Denial from 2010, uh, Dutch Pavilion. Uh, so the idea was very simple. The idea uh, was to present uh, spaces which were not used many government office buildings, many government buildings throughout the Netherlands. Uh, so you could present this idea statistically, you could say that so many buildings, thousands and thousands of buildings in the Netherlands that are owned by the government uh, just waste in space. They are not being put to any kind of use. So this would be just uh, statistics. Uh, but how do you present it creatively? And uh, this particular exhibition uh, presented this idea visually and spatially. So you would walk into the space, you would look up. Uh, there were no drawings, nothing. You would just look up and you would see this uh, uh, blue form shapes, sexagons and squares, rectangles and triangles. And then you would take the stair and go up. And this is what you would see. Well, you can see this whole city floating, and then you can realize that uh, these are the buildings that are not used in, in the country. And this is just, this is an image, and all of a sudden it becomes not just statistics, but experience. And the same year, this was another exhibition at the Belgian Pavilion, and they wanted to talk about uh, where use in architecture. So they collected these materials, uh, these fragments from buildings that were uh, demolished in Belgium. And they presented these fragments in the pavilion as works of art, as multi-million dollar uh, paintings and sculptures. And they put them on display. And all of a sudden, uh, they shifted our understanding and our about you know, this waste, basically this waste that was going to go into the garbage became, you know, the, was put on display in this gallery-like space. And this uh, design, this gallery became so successful that uh, if you 
visit Belgium and Berlin, you know, a couple of times after that United, and I think they still can't get over this particular display because every time they show something very, very similar to it. And right now, if you go to Belgium to Berlin and Venice, you will see, I don't remember what was the thing, um, but everything is put on display in a very similar way. So all of a sudden you slow down and you're afraid to touch anything because they, they might be incredibly expensive works of art. But uh, in this case they're not, they are just waste. Uh, waste. Um, this is a certain time gallery of uh, This particular Vivian is by Jean Nouvel. Uh, but the idea, but the reason I put it here is show that exhibitions could also be presented in a form of women. So certain kind of gallery has a program starting to, uh, starting from 2000. Every year they, they select a particular architect from around the world who never built in Britain. And they commissioned that architect to do it. And this year it was uh, here in this pavilion. Um, but this year is a little different. Uh, they invited four other architects to present smaller buildings, four summer houses. And uh, uh, this is one of the four by Bruno Friedman. And um, uh, it's interesting that when you are uh, commissioned to do a building, uh, how do you resolve that? What do you put on display? So the pavilion could be many things. It could make, for example, people comfortable. It could protect them from the sun. Uh, it could give them comfort or see them. Uh, but at the same time, it could be a manifesto uh, for the work of particular architects. So in this case, this is the work of John Friedman. And the reason I chose him is because I interviewed him in uh, Paris last year, he is now 93 years old. Uh, he became well known in the 1960s when he proposed his uh, bill uh, special, special. Uh, so these are floating cities that he proposed for over many different cities around the world, like in Paris. And uh, his idea was to present, to think about the ideas how cities, how historical cities could grow. So this would be another layer of cities. The cities would float um, on top of existing historical cities. So this is an example in Paris from 1959. And this is another example of how a bridge-like superstructure wouldn't even touch the landscape. And uh, it would contain the whole city within it while the landscape would be attached. And uh, his idea was that architects would kind of step back and give all the freedom to the end users. And anyone could build a house that float within this system, this uh, wireframe, this uh, framework, and the house could extend any direction, down, upwards, uh, to the side, and it would have plenty of Air space, plenty of sun. So this is a very utopian uh, idea, but we can ask the question: Is it utopian because we never built it, or is it utopian because it's unbuilt and maybe it was just ahead of time, and maybe in the future this is how it's going to be? Um, so. Uh, this is part of the exhibition right now in the Serpent Time of Berlin, and they're working on a catalog. The catalog was just published, and uh, Jonathan Friedman asked me to write an essay about his work. So, this is my relation to the Berlin. And uh, just to show you uh, some examples of my own exhibitions, uh, this was uh, my first, I would say, exhibition in 2009 in Moscow. Uh, the curator of the exhibition, of the main exhibition, uh, decided to design the whole space, uh, uh, divide, divided the whole space into 
of 12 pavilions, and each pavilion was 12 meters by 12 meters, 10 meters high. And he asked different curators uh, to design a particular uh, exhibition within each pavilion. And I was given one of the pavilions. Uh, the theme of the exhibition was green architecture. And uh, his, uh, the main idea was to, to show uh, different green ideas, concepts within our, uh, for architecture. And he said, you know, we don't have uh, green architecture in Russia, uh, but we'll collect certain projects. But what I want you to do is to show uh, examples from outside of Russia. So I asked uh, 12 different architects to present different projects. And uh, so this is how it was realized. And uh, you would walk into the space. It would be turned into this uh, kind of green environment. And uh, there were four screens, one on each wall. And each work would be presented through videos. Every architect would be presented, every project would be presented with a six minute video and uh, overall there were 72 minutes of different videos and there was also a few glass music inside so it was like an immersive environment and uh, this is another exhibition on um, the work of Anthony Names who is uh, an American architect based in Atlanta and um, he is a big admirer of Becker Cartier and he works not only as an architect, but also as a painter, as a sculptor. And uh, I offered him to do an exhibition at one of the houses that uh, was done by Le Corbusier. Uh, so Le Corbusier did only one house in... So this is the model uh, in the Americas. This is in La Plata, outside of Buenos Aires. And uh, so it's the only house that Le Corbusier designed in uh, North America or South America. And, um, and right now the, the, the house is functioning as a gallery space and they have exhibitions. And the idea was to scatter the work of companies within this house in different places. And uh, this is an exhibition that I've done on uh, the work of Australian architect Harry Sider. Uh, he was the most probably uh, uh, the most famous architect in Australia of the 20th century. And um, I happened to meet his widow, uh, uh, Penelope Sider, who you can see here on this photograph, uh, when the house was just built in 1967. And uh, she invited me to this house, and after she showed the house, uh, I told her, you know, I am in love with the work of your husband. Do you think it would be a good idea to uh, do an exhibition of um, at his projects right here in Sydney, a small exhibition? And she just said that, oh, well, that's a good idea, but why don't you do a world tour? And uh, so that became a major uh, project for me. And uh, I just want to mention that uh, this particular painting is by Theo van Dasburg, uh, the Dutch artist. Uh, it's called Space Time Construction from uh, number three, from 1923. And this painting became uh, a metaphor and inspiration for this particular house. So this house, if you look at this house, you wouldn't really find any historical precedent for this house. And uh, I would say that the, the, the only precedent that you could find would be in visual arts, like paintings and sculptures. And this particular painting is, is one of the inspirations, and it was the, the most favorite, the favorite uh, work of art by the architect. And uh, when it was his 70th birthday, uh, the wife uh, found this painting and gave it as a present. And when he died in 2006, she donated the painting to the National Gallery of Australia in Hungary. And um, what's interesting about this particular architect is that not only he collaborated with many artists, 
uh, but every work of architecture was based on a particular or number of uh, artworks. It was based on the same principles. So you can see here that, uh, for example, he was a student of Joseph Dockers in Blackhamton well, College, which is a kind of reincarnation of public house in America. And uh, you can see uh, the same kind of dynamic form and juxtaposition of different colors, shapes, and forms uh, in the plan of this particular project, which was not realized in Australia, and the facade of this, uh, one of the earliest of his houses. And then the same Joseph Albers uh, did uh, painting in 1926 called Gold Rosa, uh, gave an inspiration for the facade of one of the residential buildings. And you might say that, well, this is a very literal way of translating art into uh, architecture. But what's interesting about Seiler is that he, he would never just mindlessly translate something there. Uh, he would always uh, find uh, a good reason and uh, logic. Uh, so he would always use, for example, materials to their advantage. Uh, that he would always try to, uh, to make the most uh, out of the list, uh, with the least effort. And for example, in this particular case, when this house, when this project was built, uh, at that time there was a very conservative fire code in Australia. You couldn't build glass facade building, and you had to have uh, a solid separation between the floors. And he got away with that by uh, introducing this checkerboard uh, pattern, and uh, he did have it in uh, the separation, but at the same time, he had this uh, uh, very interesting corners where uh, woods would touch. And uh, here's another example of different books. Uh, this is his own project, and this is a painting by Frank Stella, another piece by on Carver, and what unites the architect and the artist is that uh, they all use the same geometry, the same principles. They use uh, geometry of a circle, such as uh, quadrants and semicircles. And uh, this became a uh, theme for the architect. And now you can see how many examples, how many of these examples you can find in his work. So this uh, schemes, uh, this are schematic drawings by Frank Stella for his paintings. And you can find these elements in the work of uh, Eric Sack. And uh, what else is uh, key for this particular exhibition is that this painting became also an inspiration for, my, for the design of my exhibition. So the idea was to transform the exhibition space into painting, and not just any painting, but this particular painting. And uh, I tried to use these colors from the painting in, in the gallery, and each color became uh, an accent. And uh, it was to show a particular collaboration between the architect and a particular artist. And, uh, and he collaborated with so many great artists like Alexander Holden, older and Joseph Albers, and Stella, and uh, the engineers uh, such as uh, Pierre Ruggiero, and uh, uh, architects such as Oscar Niemeyer, and uh, uh, Marcel Kroer, and Rothschild. So this was very intense. Collaboration. And here you can see some of the examples of how this project traveled throughout uh, different cities around the world. This was in Riga, in uh, the building that used to be a uh, church, and it's uh, the oldest building, 800 years old building in the city. And uh, it's interesting how spaces uh, such as exhibition spaces can be used politically for different reasons. Uh, there are different uh, uh, 
you know, events going on in the exhibitions, sometimes related to the exhibition, sometimes totally unrelated. And it's interesting that uh, uh, during the time that uh, this exhibition was presented in, in Riga, there was a political forum going on with several uh, prime ministers of Europe. And uh, they decided to, to do that forum within the exhibition space. But it was completely unrelated to, to the exhibition itself. And this was in uh, Sao Paulo, in Brazil, presented in a museum, traditional museum, art museum. And uh, this was at the university in Buenos Aires. So every time the exhibition would completely transform and be presented very differently. And this is the work, but this is the book which became a kind of byproduct based on the exhibition. And, uh, and now I'm working on another book which is going to be called Paris Under the Exhibition, which will present all this material how the exhibition was created and how it traveled around the world. And uh, this is a new exhibition that I'm working on right now. It's going to open in Sydney next month. And it's based on this book, uh, which I published uh, last year. And this is a book of my interviews with Canadian uh, International Architects. In this book, uh, there are 30 Architects, and now uh, the idea is to present uh, the architects' voices and visions and ideas uh, in the format of exhibitions. So basically, I am traveling around the world collecting all these voices, all these ideas, all these thoughts, dissect them into quotes and words and ideas, and present them in the format of exhibitions. And, um, oh, this is the book that I mentioned at the very beginning, um, Conversations with Peter Eisenman. And this uh, uh, drawings that show how this particular exhibition is going to look like in city. So uh, this is a different exhibition. These are different names, which you probably can't see. But this is uh, uh, James Wines. Uh, you know, both bricks, Glen Market, Daniel Liviskin. So these are 13 architects. And uh, one of the architects is Jonah Friedman, uh, who I mentioned I interviewed in Paris last year. And I chose his work to unite all other projects. So uh, the idea was to recreate one of his floating cities make it into a kind of superstructure, kind of model that would float over the floor, you know, under the ceiling of the space, and it would contain projectors, and you would come under it, and you would put out that voice. So you would listen to the voices of the architects, and you would look around at the different intervals, and you would see different images coming from the work of this subject. This is this is the last one. Um, so this is
and it was just overload. I, I couldn't take it. I, after a while, I had to run through the spaces. And I know Ashok was there a few days ago, and he had warned me and he said, You can't do it in one day. And I did it all in one day, but it left me so saturated. But it was a delight, I think, but you were there at the opening, and two days I presume. So I think from an architect's perspective, you always come to an exhibition trying to look at the content of the exhibition rather than the framework and the subject of the exhibition. I think it's very nice to hear this sort of different take on it. Questions, anyone? Observations? Edgar, would you be very serious? Tucked away your book also. Well, maybe you can talk a little bit about Saturday and where that's coming from. Yeah. Yes, uh, on Saturday, please come. There is going to be uh, an exhibition. There will be a talk that I will be giving on the work of Sergei Chopin, uh, mainly his uh, drawings. Uh, he is uh, a German Russian architect, but also he is uh, a graphic. Well, oh, he is uh, uh, a draftsman, uh, very good draftsman, and in addition to being an architect. He's also a collector of architectural graphics and he collects uh, historical drawings and contemporary drawings and he amassed a very significant uh, collection of German of architectural drawings and uh, he built a museum which is called Museum of Museum for Architectural Drawing. And uh, so the exhibition is on his drawings, but in the lecture I will also talk about the significance of uh, drawings and why architects should not give up hand drawing as a, as a skill and how it informs uh, their architecture and uh, the importance of such things as texture, as scale, and other issues and how they will interact with the historical city. Uh, uh, how do you deal with the scale? <coughs> because the scale now is a bit different from historical scale. And uh, so please come on Saturday. Yeah. It's actually an exhibition also, so there are drawings yeah. that I still get. Which, uh, there are about 60, about 60 drawings, uh, large scale drawings. So they will take over the space and take over the walls. Some, 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 some drawings are his, uh, the drawings that he did uh, during his travels, uh, and also some fantasies, you know, how he reimagines historical cities and new cities. Uh, they're quite interesting because they are not just what, what you see there, but they are also uh, his interpretations and his uh, fantasies, which are quite interesting. Some of them are quite radical. Uh, they are not meant to be built. They are real fantasies. Hi. 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 Good evening to the Biennale recently. Uh, I'm seeing other, uh, other, uh, there's a main Biennale exhibition in Germany and also at the other than that, there are many small exhibitions happening. And uh, Time Space Exhibition is another exhibition which is there. Whether I go to the art of this coordination center, it's very good. This is the guy, by the way. Global Art of Space Coordination and Art Organization. The Peter Einstein work also is there, is in a room. Uh, they have displayed his work. Yeah, I've seen, I actually, I did see his work. I'm not sure I've seen that work. I mean, he's also in the, one of the exhibitions, about 100 architects from six continents have been put in two buildings, uh, Palace of Mora and Palace of Bengo. And this is, uh, uh, I just want to know because there are two different kinds of exhibitions which are going on right now. One is that it's Arsene and then it's a vast space, you are in a journey where there is a lot of space and I'm situations and things like that. The other part of the time space exhibitions is a small building 
where the artists are either a small room or a co-op or yes. just like that. Yes, that's so the kind of presentation of uh, you know ideas of architects or their works is absolutely at a different scale. So as a curator, I mean I thought so if you have seen it, I mean how do you what do you find the difference between the two as a person who is uh, a visitor? How you react to an exhibition like this, like a small space but you want to present your work. And this is another one where you have a uh, you know installation or a big installation which is that you can actually uh, work on present presentation of the idea. Well, uh, again, we have to be very specific about uh, the presentation. Like, for example, uh, you know, there was a, an exhibition on the work of Walker. Uh, so they only showed uh, video projections uh, on three sides of the walls. Of the walls. So it was all about. Uh, well, this was a kind of uh, celebration of the project because they showed what they've done and uh, trying to catapult people into their environment and, and show how uh, you know, buildings they built work and how they could be, I don't know, maybe imagine how that particular city Singapore could keep growing or how can that idea be applied in other cities. Um, I think that's that's a very interesting way of uh, presenting uh, projects. Uh, Peter Eisenman showed, you know, again, kind of just go back into his work. And uh, he started his presentation with his own certificate of birth. Yeah. <laughs> which is, yeah, so which is uh, very strange. Um, uh, but you, you, you have to be you have to be very specific about you know, how do you start, what questions do you ask, what questions do you raise, what is important to you as a, you know, as an architect, um, because uh, you know you can create an exhibition and it will travel from place to place without any changes and just uh, inform others about your work, um, but. As a curator, for me, it would be interesting to discover something, do something else, and maybe an exhibition about uh, a work of a particular architect would be very different from his own work. So an exhibition about the work would be very different from the work itself. So this might be very interesting, because you always have to ask the question, how do you represent architecture? There are so many uh, Ways, but almost all of them are they're not detected, they're not uh, possible. You can never recreate uh, you know, the experience of visiting a real building. So even if you put models on display, you never see a real building at that scale. You're always going to have issues, you're always going to have difficulties with transforming them. So maybe uh, one idea is to do an exhibition is to get away from this idea of representation at all. And you just don't represent anything. And everything that you put on display becomes an original work. Uh, so and then there are many ways of doing it. Because even if you show the video, again, it's a way of representing the projects.
would say that it was a point of incredible journey that it was dying of the place. Uh, just one observation. Uh, because it must have been very difficult for you to actually keep out. You know, to keep out of traffic from Bihar. Uh, one artist that I always felt was uh, sort of in the 50s, 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, that created another way of perceiving the art by even actually refusing to engage with it. Was in France, that went to America, Marcel Duchamp, who already made the uh, incident with Dada and Surrealism, and any sort of um, do you ever think that uh, Marcel Duchamp would have been an important uh, player in this uh, scenario of yours? How was he left out? Well, uh, I think as far as Marcel Duchamp, I, I would say that he is an inspiration for my particular exhibition of voices because uh, voices, you can say, uh, really names. So I grab these voices, uh, someone else's voices, and put them on display. So this is something similar to uh, So in, in that case, it is an inspiration for, for me personally, very important inspiration, because uh, when you put a voice, you know, I don't want to call it just an interview, uh, because an interview is between two people, we're going to have many different voices and uh, no matter what happens uh, they will interact with each other and they will become something else also I'm trying to uh, separate different parts of the conversations and put an accent on particular phrases and particular quotes and all of a sudden if you take them out of context you concentrate on a particular phrase, it may sure change on the bit meaning. So it's similar to what Duchamp did. And uh, so in that case, he is definitely an inspiration. Also, Hansel Rehofers did an exhibition called Do It, which is very famous. And uh, basically, the idea was that uh, he uh, started asking artists from around the world to write. Um, you know, kind of like recipes, uh, descriptions of their projects, and these projects will be recreated every time in different museums. And by now, he has over, he has a couple of hundred of these recipes of these uh, descriptions, and he lets different museums around the world to choose which of these artworks they want to recreate. So these artworks are recreated. They can be 30, 40, 50, 60 of these works. They put on this plate, and after the show, they are all destroyed. And this exhibition has a life now of over 20 years. It's good. going around the world, so it's kind of similar. It's similar in that way. And it's a self propelled project because every time new people do it, new people choose which objects they want to do and, uh, and it becomes this and every time the context is different so if the voices is the same there will be different exhibitions there will be different voices put on display but i want i want to do the same thing i want to collaborate with different artists to to recreate this exhibition every time different so there is something to jump in about that. <laughs> Slightly awkward question to ask, but I think exhibitions are egoistic in that sense because the word exhibition is is a not a very kind word to use. Which which one? When we say exhibitionist, and first question is are
really doing. And what we're really doing is very different from what we're saying we're doing as our presence. But what I find troubling with this is that it's almost highly polarized. You have to be either in the Aravena camp or the Foster camp, right? And there does the Foster is now recently the Aravena. And that's, that's politically forcing you to do it. I mean, if you're invited to Aravena, Spina, he must have looked at his 500 projects and found the one which represented closest the growth board and decided to showcase and build a small module of that there. But I'm saying that if you look at Aravena's statements even during the BNR days, he's pretty much saying that architects are stable with capitalism and they are the new people in society unless they are doing what I think architects should be doing. So that's a very extreme stand to take. It puts the rest of the profession almost under black lens. You can also, uh, I would say, slows down the profession because, uh, yeah. you know, I found that uh, architects will have very distinctive voices, very distinctive form, forms of architecture. Uh, they are trying to number their voices. Uh, their voices are no longer as, uh, <clears throat> as loud. And uh, you can see that uh, also there is an interesting tendency, for example, if you look at the voices of architecture, the most extreme voices, you will find out that the most extreme voices are now in their 80s. They are 84, 85, 86, 89, 93, whatever. But they are the most original architects we have today, as far as for me. Talk about Frank Gehry from uh, Peter Eisen. And unfortunately, we no longer have that. So, this voice is uh, basically leaving us. So, the generation behind, uh, they are really not as distinctive, and they are trying to fit in by lowering their voices. And the generation which is coming, which is out of that, which is Gehry the next generation. They are openly saying we don't want to have this. That's what they're saying. We want teamwork and we want uh, to solve problems. And uh, what's interesting is that we have a situation when we have so many different voices, so many different architectures. But at the same time, it may take several years the building silence, complete silence. Obviously, there won't, there won't be silence, but there is so much criticism about uh, the work of Zafra, Gary, Alatrava, that inevitably they will try, they are trying as much as possible to make their work less distinct and to lessen. And, uh, <clears throat> and the next generation not even trying that at all. So we are moving in the direction where architecture will become much less about forming, much less about itself, and much more about the common ground that we were looking for. We were looking for common ground just a few years ago, and then imagine we finally found it, and what happened? It was even though I guess. <laughs> There are no more questions. We will call it an evening. Thank you so much for coming and look forward to seeing you again on Saturday exhibition and the talk starts at 6 5.30 is the exhibition opening and we will follow it by the talk at 6.30. So please join us. We'll have a